Um, she holds an MFA in poetry from Florida International University. She's the author of several books, Magic City Gospel, Dark Thing, and a, the newest one, Reparations Now. Her poetry has earned many awards, including the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, the Silver Medal in the Independent Publishers Book Awards, the Lena Miles Weaver Todd Prize, I hope I said that right, for poetry, and also a literature fellowship from the Alabama State Council on the Arts, which is one of the highest awards they give. Also, the Lucille Clifton Prize and the Lucille Clifton Legacy Award. And she was a finalist for the Ruth Lily Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship in 2020. She has poems, has published poems in many journals, and she teaches at the School of Fine Arts, as I said, and she also has been teaching recently in a low residency MFA program at Converse College. But that's not everything. She co-directs Penn Birmingham, as in Penn America, which is a recently, uh, relatively new um, chapter of Penn. And so if you're interested in that organization, um, she's the one to talk to. She's also the founding director of the Magic City Poetry Festival, which really injected a lot of new energy for poetry in Birmingham and will keep going once it gets, once we get out of COVID and we can do more things in person. One of her most recent um, achievements, which is really paying lots and lots of interesting dividends, is that she was invited to be a guest editor of Poetry Magazine. And um, if you don't know what that means, let me tell you something. You talk SEC, this is above the SEC <laughs> to get to be the guest editor of Poetry Magazine. And so in that, in that capacity, she was able to showcase a number of poets from Alabama, young, old, different, black, white, ma female, and male, right? And so she, she, it was just a wonderful and amazing platform to get to have, to edit three issues and write introductions for those. Because she did that, she was approached by University of Michigan Press to do a book in their Poets on Poetry, Poets on Poetry series about, um, it's called What the Mirror Said, the necessity of black women in poetry. And so this is gonna be a book of her critical writing. So her being the, the historic designation that she has as the first African-American poet laureate and the youngest poet laureate, but not the first woman poet laureate. <laughs> um, because our outgoing poet laureate, I need to say, is Jennifer Horn from here in Tuscaloosa who couldn't be with us today, she's out of town, but Jennifer served for four years and did a whole lot also to help. But all of this is such a wonderful um, bouquet of achievements, and it also is a bouquet to Alabama literary arts. Because Ashley is being interviewed by people like Charles Blow on CNN, she's gonna have an interview in the New York Times, and every time people read all of this, they're gonna see that she's from Alabama, okay? So we need to elevate and lift up and celebrate that in times when um, we need to do that. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to ask Ashley to come and read, and I know y'all are going to be really, um, you're going to really love this. She's a fabulous reader. Thank you. The switch, the switch is on top. Yeah. She's got her own. Oh, you got your own. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeannie, for that introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I am nervous for many reasons. I've not been doing too many in-person readings because obviously we're in a pandemic. Um, and this is my one of my first in-person readings with no mask on. So we're just gonna bless the air that we are all breathing, <laughs> that we make it home without yes. any infection. Um, so I am going to pull up my set list. I can't really go off the cuff like some poets. I have to, have, I'm very type A, so I have to have my, my list. All right. So I'm going to read from each of my books this afternoon. I'm going to start with Magic City Gospel, which was my first book. And since we're talking about spirits, I always want to bring the spirit of my ancestors into any space. So I want to start with a poem about my Aunt Hattie, 
Um, now, my people are from around these parts. I have family in Greensboro, Alabama, and in Northport as well. So this poem is about Aunt Hattie, who lived in Greensboro. Um, and she allowed me to do a very special thing, which I'll describe in this poem. Um, and for those who are, you know, poetry heads, this is a villanelle, so listen for the rhymes, um, if that's your thing. Eating red dirt in Greensboro, Alabama. I ate red dirt for the first time with Aunt Hattie, big brown blind angel who listened to local crimes on her police scanner. Its monotone lullaby crooned all through the night, piercing, faithful. When she heard it was my first time, she sent us to the hill we scraped it off, tried to ignore the ants and the strange, dull, sour scent. Stealing dirt, a local crime, only punished by whatever was hiding inside our Ziploc bags. A pill bug, a ladybug's broken shell. Back from the hunt for the first time, I realized how cityfied I really was. Scared of something so full of local germs. But was it a crime to fear eating dirt? Finally, my southern pride made me put it to my lips, resist the acidic pull of bile in my throat. And for the first time, I felt like a local swallowing this bittersweet crime. That's that one. All right. Has anybody eaten dirt before out there? Okay, we have some, some dirt eating people. It's very good for you, actually. It's very good for women, red dirt. And not any dirt. I don't know, since my aunt Hattie has passed on, I don't know how to find the good dirt. So I just don't do it. Because um, I don't want to eat just any dirt. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. This next poem is about the Children's March, which happened in Birmingham in 1963, um, which we all may know, but just in case we don't. Um, during that time, of course, there was a lot of civil unrest for very good reason. And um, this particular march, the Children's March, featured children of all ages. And they marched through downtown Birmingham and were met, of course, with Will Connor and his army of terrorizing people. Um, and you probably have seen all of the images of children being sprayed down in the streets and dogs being released on um, the children. So I wanted to write a poem which was sort of from their perspective. Um, and it is a series of haiku. Birmingham Fire and Rescue Haiku 1963. What about us said we were on fire? What said extinguish quickly, fill up the hose and set the dogs loose? Could they smell our confusion or was it our singing? Were our voices like sirens, a chorus of blood? We were wet black seeds in that raw Birmingham flesh. We germinated. Did the photos show our fingers stretching like roots? Did they show our eyes how they reached sunward to the hot, bright, silent star that could turn water to steam, seeds to fruit? Did they see themselves become our fertilizer? Okay, so a little secret about me um, that I probably should not share um, is that whenever I give readings and there's a podium with no covering on the front, I get really self-conscious people can see my legs. Um, and I don't know why that is, but I'm always just like, ooh, what do I do with my body? People can see all of it. Um, so yeah, it helps the, the anxiety if you acknowledge it, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm gonna move into my second book, which is called Dark Thing. And I want to read a poem about Harriet Tubman, um, again, just on the subject of spirits that we want to bring into the space. Um, Harriet Tubman is, of course, a superhero of America, of the whole world. Um, and I have several poems in this book about her because during the time of writing this book, I just became obsessed with her. Um, and I wanted to write some pieces that really focused on her humanity because often when we have these superhuman, seemingly superhuman people in history, we take away their humanity. And I find that happens a lot with black women. Um, especially. So I wanted to celebrate 
her and her story. Um, this poem is called The Book of Tubman, and it tells the story of how she started the Underground Railroad. Um, all you need to know is that um, her birth name was Araminta Ross. Um, she changed her name to Harriet, which was her mother's name when she first escaped from slavery in order to sort of deter the slave catchers. And um, she also was called the Black Moses because she took people out of a bad place into the promised land, so to speak. The Book of Tubman. And God said, let her head be split, a black melon leaking. And God let iron sprout from the master's hand. And God breathed blood in the master's eyes and said, strike. And that's the story of the great crack in Harriet's skull that was an eye. That's the way God poured her full of visions, thick as sap, unmoving, slowed as a scab over the gash. And God said, let there be Harriet. And Araminta went on to glory. Araminta could smile in heaven, hoist her skirts above her ankles and dance. Harriet on earth kept that sweet eye fixed on the North Star, kept her pistol cocked, each bullet an unsaid prayer. And God made a railroad out of dirt and sweat, made a train out of a woman. And God made her hair a burning bush, her body so holy, even he called her Moses. Okay. So I'll do one more from this book. Um, and this one, if I can get to it, is about my grandmother, Willie Lou Lipscomb, um, who was from here in Greensboro, as here in Greensboro nearby. Um, as well. And um, I actually wrote this poem on the day of her funeral. Um, I was sitting at her kitchen table and it really felt like she was still there. I mean, you know, or at least in my mind, um, the body is just a case for what's, you know, what else we have inside of us, our soul. Um, and I felt like she was still there. Like, I really thought if I turned the corner, she would be sitting in her chair like she always was. Um, so I took out a napkin from the kitchen table and I started to write this poem. Um, and this is, this is it red dirt sweet and I have to give uh, thanks to Anna Ray Jeffers who's another amazing writer um, who has ties to Alabama uh, yeah please clap for Anna Ray because she is blowing it up right now for real um, if you have not purchased her book the love song with W.E.B. Du Bois you definitely should um, but yeah she's amazing and she has a book called red clay sweet so I have to give honor to her because our titles are similar and of course I'm very influenced by her she was actually the first like real poet I saw at the age of 12. Um, and when I saw her reading at my school, I thought, okay, yeah, I can do this. She's doing it. Red Dirt Sweet. One. And there, there's three parts, I think. I should say that. There's, no, there's four. Because sometimes when poets start reading a poem and they just say, start saying one, two, it goes all the way to 20, and you're like, wait. <laughs> so I'm telling you ahead of time, there are four parts. There's four, okay. <laughs> I know I'm a poet too, but sometimes I'm like, look, you know, <laughs> too much is too much. Okay, Red Dirt Sweet, one. In your house, grandmother, even the furniture smiles. The grainy glow of the red dirt in piles and hills outside the window warms us, eyes first. The quiet streets whisper your love as we drive through them. The clouds puff up with your buoyant cackle. Here today, grandmother, I didn't even realize you were missing from your chair. Somehow, your body never was what brought us to you. I see so clearly the shadow of your spirit floating in between my own two hands. I will drink it in like sweet tea. Let your sugar linger, spread. Two, I've been working my whole life. We was out in them fields working. All there was were crops as far as anyone could see. Even our dreams lined up in rows. The chickens came and went at the factory. 
take one leg, hang it, take the other, and like a flag, like a banner, like my own two arms spread wide, they're ready for the slaughter. Like us, they know this work well. They do it because they must. My children need feeding, and the chickens will have to do. The school lunchroom will have to do. The white people's houses will have to do. Three. I was born in starry Alabama. The night mixed me up a blue so sweet, I swallowed it whole. The day swirled its clouds into a song, my lullaby. God's clear voice as I slid into this world. Girl, I take my love and shape your body around it. I give you my heart to borrow. 86 years later, he will call on me again. He will slide from his crystal cocoon and find me smiling. He will find me searching my own mind for him. Four. The cars line up in the yard. We come from all corners for you. We, your harvest, will travel from anywhere to send you home. The cars line up in the yard. Without you here to tell us, we must ask our own family who they are. Without you, we talk around ourselves to find you. Even our hellos sound like your name. How you doing, Willie Lee? How you been, Willie Lee, Willie Lee, Willie Lee? All right, so there's just a few more left. I'm gonna read four poems from my new book, Reparations Now. Now, let me just say right now, I have to apologize. I don't have a lot of books to sell, so if you came here wanting to buy a bunch of these for me, that's not gonna happen, unfortunately. I only have one copy left, so somebody's gonna have to ambush me at the end of this if they want the one of this. Um, but I have a few of Magic City Gospel. And the great thing is that my books are available wherever books are sold. So go to your local bookstores and purchase um, that book if you would like it. All right. Um, and usually I'm more prepared. I just haven't done in-person readings in like two years. So like, it came up on me a little bit, so I apologize. All right, so I'm going to read a poem about my dad. Um, so this year has been just the strangest year of my life, honestly. Um, in April, I actually lost my father. Um, he passed away unexpectedly, um, which was horrible, of course, for so many reasons. My family is incredibly close. Um, and I mean, I'm still in the grief right now, um, but trying to you know, use my art as I always have to work through it. I actually wrote this poem um, before he passed away. I was commissioned by the Southern Foodways Alliance to write a poem for their um, winter meeting. And so I interviewed my dad about his garden. He always had a garden, no matter where we lived. And the garden is still you know, there today. Um, in fact, we ate his last harvest this summer, which was really amazing to get to still be fed by him, literally and of course spiritually as well. Um, but I wrote this poem after interviewing him and I invited my parents to come to the, the event and I didn't tell my dad that I was going to read this poem so I wanted to surprise him. It was like the day after his birthday. Um, and so when it came time to read the poem, I was getting really excited and I started reading it and I looked out at the audience. And my dad was not a crying man at all. I mean, he cried maybe twice in front of us, you know, when his mom died and, you know, when his siblings passed away. Otherwise, he kept his tears quite hidden from us. But I could see him start to wipe his eyes from in the audience. And my mom later told me, oh, he was crying as soon as you started because um, he was so proud. He denied it, of course. He's like, oh, no, I was crying. But that just was the greatest gift ever. I mean, there will never be an award I could win that could top that ever, ever, ever. Because um, I, I just love my dad so much. He's the greatest dad, is the greatest dad that um, has ever lived. So this is a poem for him, and it's called Photosynthesis. When I was young, my father taught us how dirt made way for food, how to turn over soil so it would hold a seed, an infant bud, how to nurse, how the dark could nurse it until it broke its green arms out to reach the sun. In every backyard we've ever had, he made a little garden plot with room for heirloom tomatoes, corn, carrots, peppers, jalapeno, 
bell and poblano, okra, eggplant, lemons, collards, broccoli, whole beans, watermelon, squash, trees filled with fruit and nuts, Brussels sprouts, herbs, basil, mint, parsley, rosemary, onions, sweet potatoes, cucumber, cantaloupe, cabbage, oranges, Swiss chard and peaches, sunflowers tall and straight back as soldiers, lantana, amaryllis, echinacea, pansies and roses and bushes bubbling with hydrangeas. Every plant with its purpose, flowers to bring worms and wasps, how their work matters here. This is the work we have always known, pulling food and flowers from a pile of earth. The difference now, my father is not a slave, not a sharecropper. This land is his and so is this garden, so is this work. The difference is that he owns this labor, the work of his own hands for his own belly, for his own children's bellies. We eat because he works. This is the legacy of his grandmother, my great granny, Ollie Mae Harris and her untouchable flower garden. Just like her hats, her flower beds sprouted something special, plants and colors the neighbors could only dream of. He was young when he learned that this beauty is built on work. The cows and the factories in their stomachs the fertilizer they spewed out, the stink that brought such fragrance. What you call waste, I call power. What you call work, I make beautiful again. In his garden, even problems become energy, beauty. My father has ended many work days in the backyard, worries of the firehouse dropping like rain my father wrist deep in soil. I am convinced the earth speaks back to him as he feeds it. It is a conversational labor, gardening. The seeds tell him what they will be. The soil tells seeds how to grow. My father speaks sun and water into the earth. We hear him each harvest, his heartbeat sweet like fruit. And it's so funny, I had to ask my dad to list all of those plants. I'm not one of these people who can just name stuff as they see it. Some people are like, oh, that's an oak, that's a pine, that's a blah, blah, blah thing. I see tree and tree and tree and tree. So um, I just love that list, but don't get it twisted. I cannot identify anything. Uh, <laughs> all my dad. Um, all right, so I'm gonna read a love poem, which is something I rarely ever do. Uh, for reasons we don't have time for here today. Um, <laughs> um, but this poem um, comes out of my love for the song Simply Beautiful by Al Green. If you've never heard this song, I urge, yeah, Mark knows. If you've heard, never heard this song, I urge you to hear it. Um, it is just incredible. I mean, really anything by Al Green, it has the spirit on it. Like, you should listen for sure. Um, there's this, actually, not to go off topic, but there's this recording of him singing Jesus is waiting. I think he was at like Soul Train. And like, I feel like the spirit of God is just on the sweat coming off this man's body. Like <laughs> it's ridiculous, which is, it's an interesting feeling to be uh, ignited by the Lord and also the sweat off this beautiful man at the same time. It's fascinating. Anyway, this poem um, comes from that song. And there's the opening line of the song, which says, if I gave you my love, I tell you what I do. I'd expect a whole lot of love out of you. And he, he sings it, but I'm not a singer, so you know, uh, we're not doing that. But in that if, if I gave you my love, I felt like I could hear so much of my own um, imaginings of what love could look like for me. Um, so what lives in the if in Al Green's Simply Beautiful? In the room of my love, there is a whole world. 
There is a bass guitar that plays all by itself. There is fire in the hearth crackling. And there is a brown hue all over. That's my skin. My skin and my love are inseparable. In the room of my love, there is a growl and a giggle. There is a never ending meal. Cornbread and collard greens and ham hocks and neck bones and sweet potato pie and mac and cheese, the good kind, not the kind at church or the kind that one aunt swears is good or the kind in the blue box. And potato salad, barbecue ribs, coleslaw, baked beans, corn on the cob, pound cake, all on the same plate and great Kool-Aid and spring water and broccoli and cheese casserole and fried chicken and smothered pork chops and sausage and gravy and pancakes and butter. And in the room of my love, there is room maybe for you, but only if Al Green is playing and only if your hand is shaped, love, like a key. All right, we are almost at the end. Uh, thank y'all for listening. Um, I'm going to, I'm just gonna go to my last one because I wanna leave a little time in case people wanna ask me any questions. Um, so this poem, oh, how do I preface? Um, so, okay, so I've been doing tours for my first two books. Um, I've been very fortunate to get to travel across the country to read. And um, as I've traveled, especially with my second book, um, this thing was happening where people wouldn't know where I was from because I don't really have a Southern accent. At least I don't think I do. Y'all tell me, I mean, I don't know. It's in, it's, it's, if I'm angry or something, if I'm sad or angry, like, yes, I'm very Southern. <laughs> Um, but usually people can't really clock where I'm from. So people would ask, oh, where are you coming from? And I'd say Alabama. And people literally would say, oh, are you all right? <laughs> are you okay? You know, and I'm like, well, are you okay? I mean, I don't know what's supposed to be happening to me in Alabama. And of course they have these very um, wrong ideas that Alabama contains all the racism in the entire country. Like once you step outside of Alabama, there's no more racism and that's just, Unfortunately, not true. That's never been true, no matter what anybody says. Um, the whole country is dealing with the same problems yes. to this day. Yes. Uh, whoever that is, amen to you, um, for sure, because it's just, it's it's frustrating, you know, for people to believe that because they're above the Mason-Dixon or because they're in California or whatever, that somehow people are not still suffering, that it's not written into the very laws of our state's um, discrimination against lots of people. So I wrote this poem because I was just really sick and tired of that. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone that the South is not something to, um, to blame for every problem that you know, our country has. If we look all the way back to even slavery, who was benefiting from slavery? The whole country. Yes. Same. So we were built on this discrimination. So I wanted to write about that and also, uh, there's kind of a little funny part in the title. Everywhere I go, people tell me, oh, I have a cousin or somebody from Alabama, because everybody's really from here. I mean, everywhere you go, somebody has someone from Alabama. So this is called All Y'all Really From Alabama, and it begins with an epigraph from Dr. King. The straight jackets of race prejudice and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. The subtle psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror and open brutality of the South. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Why We Can't Wait. This here, the cradle of this here nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back South. Every vein filled with red dirt blood, cotton. We the dirty word you spit out your mouth. Mason Dixon is an imagined line. You can theorize it or wish it real, but it's the same old ghost, see-through, benign. All y'all from Alabama, we the wheel turning cotton to make the nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built from death. No longitude or latitude disproves the truth of founding father's sacred oath. 
We hold these truths like dark snuff in our jaw. Black oppression's not happenstance, it's law. Thank you. Okay, so as promised in the last five minutes of my time, if anybody wants to ask me anything within reason, of course, I'm, I'm happy to answer a question or two if you have one. Shauna Stewart, what do you have? <laughs> can I ask you two questions? There we go. Yes, you um, can. 